Investment Risk, Return, and Standard Deviations. What a great title. I can't think of anything else to title this, so uh, <laughs> hopefully it drew you in. If it did, you're going to be uh, you're going to be attuned to a PVC pipe of knowledge video. PVC pipe of knowledge, everybody, which means you need to hammer that like button. Hammer it, baby. Are you hammering it? Huh? Huh? Don't make me freaking bust out the PVC pipe of knowledge if you haven't hammered it. You got a hammer time. The first MC Hammer album was fantastic. Please don't hurt him at Hammer, I think is what it's called. Please don't hurt him, Hammer. That was great. And then uh, went all downhill from there uh, in terms of hip hop and rap. Um, oh, so bad. And then like, felt us went to metal and hardcore, just like, oh, why? Can we just play regular music without trying to be. Uh, Anyway, whatever. All right, so let's uh, let's dive into this. Hey, I was at Costco today. Someone saw my Georgia Tech shirt on. Some lady, she goes, did you play for Georgia Tech? I said, no, lady, but I can pretend I did. You know what I'm saying? And then I looked over at my wife, and she was, she's like, they came in the tumble. Uh-uh-uh, not my house, actually. My wife wasn't with me, and I did not say that. But anyway, I said, no, uh, I could never get into Georgia Tech. I don't have the skill set for that. All right, so we're going to look at, I want to show you standard deviations on three different, uh, and, and returns on three different portfolios here. So we got our basic 3% rate of return portfolio with a three standard deviation. We got a middle of the road portfolio. This could be cash, basically, treasury bills. This could be bonds and stocks. 7% rate of return with a 10 standard deviation. Then we got a 10% rate of return with a 17 standard deviation. In fact, I'll show you what I'm looking at here so you can see for yourselves. So what you'll see here is we go back to my, what I've been working on. Uh, here is the Wellesley fund right here. It's got a 9.55% rate of return with a basically 9% standard deviation. All right, and that's Wellesley fund going back since inception of 1971. There's actually 1970, but we don't have a full year for 1970. This is the longest mutual fund I've ever, I could find, which is the federated, uh, no, not longest mutual fund, the longest government bond fund I could find, which federated U.S. stock fund, it goes back to 1970, has a rate of return of 5.71 with a standard deviation of 7.25. All right, and then I just, uh, I think stock, if you had a 100% stock portfolio, had like a 19% standard deviation with like an 11% rate of return. So we're just using a, something similar to that here in these regards. And what we're doing here, this is our zero, all right? So this is our line of demarcation, if that makes sense. Um, and then you can see positive returns here, negative returns here. So, oh, then I want to show you the T-bills. I had it on T-bills on here too. Let me just double check here what I had. Hold on a second. Hang tight, my friend. Yeah, so the average T-bill is right, goes back to 1871. The average T-bill has returned 3.3% with a standard deviation of three. And that's exactly what we're using here. Uh, average treasury bill, a, a, a 30 day, 90 day, maybe it's 90, I can't remember. One month, average one month T-bill, 3.3, here's inflation, by the way. So your T-bill actually beat the rate of inflation by 27 basis points annualized. You can see the standard deviation of inflation was actually higher than the standard deviation of the rate of return on T-bills. I thought that was interesting. Um, anyway, so that's what, yeah, one month T-bill right there. All right, that's going back to 1871. And then I had, um, what else I had? This is the, hold on a second. This is, this is Wellesley Fund. Yeah, we've already talked about that, Wellesley Fund. And I had over here, S&P 500, average rate of return going back to 1871 is 10.87 with an average standard deviation of 19. So we're basically pretty doggone close right there. S&P 500, T-bills, and this will be the uh, essentially a Wellesley type of fund, if that makes sense. Wellesley's done better as a rate of return with a little bit lower standard deviation. I don't expect that in the future, so we're just going to run with this. All right, so what you got here with standard deviations, remember, the standard deviation is simply the volatility around the average. The volatility around the average. So in this case, within one standard deviation, which is basically two-thirds of the time, you would get between 0 and 6% rate of return. 0 and 6% rate of return. Within two standard deviations, again, standard deviations, just the volatility around the average, and there's a square root of this, and I, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to do that, so I just use a computer. So you get between a negative three and a positive nine, all right? So within two standard deviations, 95% of the time, you get between a negative 3% rate of return and a positive 9% rate of return. With three standard deviations at three, which is 99.8% of probability, given the numbers we're using, 
All right, this is a big deal about standard deviation. This is just based on the numbers we're inputting. Doesn't mean that there can't be some kind of black swan, that there can't be some kind of event that changes standard deviations. I will look at what happened in 2022. I did a video on this. I probably should do it again, where I showed you the standard deviation of bonds pre-2022 and then post-2022, and it went up significantly. Well, I say significantly, but it certainly went up because 2022 had a significant volatility that had never been seen before in the bond market. So no bond prognosticator with any standard deviations had a 2022. It was a black swan for bonds, all right, because of the huge interest rates increase. So just because I said with a 99.8% probability doesn't mean in reality that's probable. It just means based on the numbers we're using. How do we get these numbers that we're using? Well, here is just based on historical rates of return and historical volatility. So that's, that makes sense to me. All right, so here again, we got if we have three standard deviations on any given year with a 99.8% of the time, we could be down six and up 12. Can you all see that? Down six and up 12. So here is our bell curve right here for, for this uh, T bills up 12, down six with this in the middle. All right, so you can see that little bell curve. It's still pretty wide, but not nearly as wide as this guy right here. This is basically Wellesley Fund, a 10 standard deviation with a 7% average rate of return. So within 99.8% of the time, we'd expect the Wellesley Fund to give us, uh, right here, blue, a great 37% a, a rate of return on the high end, and all the way down here, a 23% rate of return on the down end. Now, this is what's interesting about investing, and this is why I cannot stress enough that if you won the game, stop playing, but that doesn't mean you have no stocks. Remember, so even bonds, it doesn't mean you just put your money in CDs. You can, I got no qualm with that, but most of us don't have that. Most of us need to get some growth still. There's a positive bias in investing, a positive bias. Notice here is zero. Well, the facts are our, our rate of return are on the right side of zero. So inherently, we, I mean, more than 50% of the time, we would expect to have positive returns because we're positively biased. All right, if, we were, if we're neutrally biased, 50% of the time we had negative returns, 50% of the time we had positive returns. That's not the case here. Even within one standard deviation on right here, again, that's 66% of the time, two-thirds of the time, we'd have zero rate of return and positive six. That's a positive bias, which is why investing is so important to remember that is positively biased. That means that more times than not, you're going to get positive rates of return on your portfolio. If we look at store, I can't predict the future. I don't know, but I mean, that's what you'd assume or else why would you invest? If you assume there's a negative bias, it'd be like going to the freaking uh, a casino. Why would you, it's stupid, don't do that. If you assume there'd be a negative bias, it'd be like buying lottery tickets, don't do that. If you assume there'd be a neutral bias, yeah, even that, I'd say, yeah, I'm not so sure I'd want to do that. I'd just put my money in CDs because CDs guarantee me a certain rate of return, i.e. a positive bias. All right, so now you can see, see how like kind of short that is? And I call that a tight shot group there. Watch how wide this one is. And this is just a Wellesley fund, essentially, with a 7% expected rate of return and a 10% standard deviation. You can see, look at that, it's wide. Now, these are not up to scale, obviously, but still. It goes from 37 on the upside to negative 23 on the down. Again, a positive bias there. All right, now you look at a stock market here. Stock, this is 100% stock, 17, a 10% average rate of return, a 17% standard deviation. Any given year in that regard, well, 17, yeah, you get... Uh, 61% is you could be your upside with a negative 41, which is your down. The worst market we've ever had, I want to say 44% in 1930. Yeah, 1930. But when you factor in inflation, the worst market we've ever had was 37% in 2008. So that's pretty close right there, negative 41. All right. So that's what we're saying. Within 99.8% of probability, you should be no worse than negative 41%. And again, 2000, 1930, we had down 44%. But again, you factor in inflation, that was still less painful than it was in 2008, which is down 37. So that looks pretty good to me. You're like, I mean, that's not good, but you, you, I think you have a pretty good bet to say, yeah, unless freaking the commies come or whatever, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci takes over the government or Kamala wins, you know, I doubt we're going to hit that. But still, you, you don't know. I don't know. I'm not God. On the other hand, you could get a 61% on the upside. So this, I, this is, again, not drawing a sale. I can't even throw it to the upside. So we'd be way over here. You see what I'm saying? That's the decoding dyslexia, if you want to know what that says, because dyslexia is a mofo. If your kid's struggling reading, you better get it checked because that's not a good place to be. Anyway, so here would be way over here at 61%. And, you know, we've had markets, 33, I think, was up 55%. So we've had a couple years up 50% or more. So that makes sense. 
So look how wide this is right here. Huge wide berth relative to this guy right here. A very, very wide shot group. So if you're right zeroing your rifle and you had a 17% stand, a standard deviation, you're not hitting nothing with any given assurance in terms of I got a shot right there and you got this wide of a berth. You're like, yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to, I have to fire a lot of uh, bullets down range to hit my target. All right. But if you had a smaller, a tighter shot group, you don't have to fire as many bullets to hit your target. But with that said, you're also not going to be able to hit as far because the facts are you have a tighter shot group. I know that's probably not a great analogy, but you can see here, we're not going to be able to shoot as far because our tight, our shot group is tighter. Here we can shoot far and wide, but it's going to take a lot more bullets to hit those targets because it's such a wide berth there. Anyway, so that's how it works. So the more, and again, just inherently obvious, the more risk you take to get a higher rate of return, the more wide your risk and return potential to be. The less risk you take to get a lower rate of return, the lower your standard deviation, the lower your rate of return probability, and a smaller shot group there. Now, the issue is, and just kind of going over my numbers here, um, hang tight. All right, so just looking at one thing using a, t so right here, the, the worst case scenario with a, uh, a 50, 20, 25, 20, uh, 50, 25, 25 portfolio going back to 1926, uh, using Craig Israelson's uh, retirement portfolio analyzer, this stuff right here. The worst thing we've ever saw was a, a net rate of return of 1.88. That means a, you have your gross rate of return minus inflation. The worst we ever had is 1.88, and that was in 1957. All right, so I'm using a standard deviation of 10.5, and I'm giving rates of return to net us 1.88. So I'm giving us here 1.88 return, inflation is zero, we're netting 1.88. Here I'm giving us a 20% rate of return, inflation is 18.12, netting 1.88. So what you'll see here is the higher the rate of return, even with the higher uh, inflation, because the standard deviation is still small, not small, stable, we have a, more, a better probability of success. I mean, it's just it's kind of inherently, inherently that should sound obvious. L lower standard deviation, higher rate of return. Even with higher inflation, we should be more probably successful. And the simple reason is because we're making more money for our, our dollar bill. Uh, and the standard deviation hasn't adjusted as high as it would for a smaller rate of return. I, I hope that makes sense. But anyway, so here we got a 1.88 rate of return with a 10.5 standard deviation. Yep, I doubt you'll ever see that, but I just used that example. They only had a 44% probability of success of withdrawing 4% a year adjusted with inflation. And again, the inflation here is zero. Here they had a 64% probability of return, a 4% withdrawal rate adjusted for inflation at 18.12, uh, and they still left a median v value of 145,000 on a million dollar portfolio. And the reason is frankly, because their standard deviation is well below historical for that kind of rate of return. So it's not really a fair comparison, but I just wanted to show you that standard deviation isn't really the driver so much as rates of return and investments in, uh, in net uh, net, rates of return and net investment returns. Now, standard deviation plays a role because you're never going to get a 20% rate of return with a 10% standard deviation uh, for any significant uh, experience. You just won't. But uh, I say you just won't. I don't know. But generally speaking, that would be silly to even plan for that. But I just wanted to show that to you, that just to show you the lower the standard deviation, the higher the rate of return, you're more probability of success, if that makes sense. Even though you have a net 1.88 across the board, it's still the lower the standard deviation, the higher the rate of return. That's where you're shooting for. Now, you got to be careful. You don't want to shoot for a low standard deviation and a low return because that's kind of what happened here. Uh, if we look at it, we have a low standard deviation, a low return, even though the net is still 1.88, we, we didn't make it for, uh, we, we didn't have any money left over when we died 56% of the time. So we still were shooting for a higher standard deviation, a higher rate of return with a lower standard deviation. And obviously we want to make sure that we have a much greater rate of return gross than our inflation rate as well. All right. And again, this is just for people who need the capital to build. If you have more capital, capital and you're able to uh, dip into that without any, who cares? I'm talking about people who need the capital to grow. If you need the capital to grow, you're trying to reduce the standard deviation, increase the rate of return, and get your inflation, your net as high as possible from gross rates of return to inflation. Anyway, I know there's a lot of yapping, but this is a PVC pipe of knowledge. And whenever we're doing the PVC pipe of knowledge, there's going to be some yapping by your old buddy Josh. Love your thoughts. God bless and paw the like button. We'll see you.